Okay, I think we're going to start. Um, thank you for coming, of course, uh, here to the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication. I'm Ralph Bellavo. I am the head of the Media Arts Area uh, here at the Gaylord College, and I'm very uh, excited and interested uh, to hear what several of my colleagues from the university and some people from the community have to say about this very important topic. And of course you, um, because you're a very important part of this also, uh, to have a conversation about how we want to think about these issues as a community. Um, I'd like to start out by introducing uh, the Assistant Dean of the Gaylord College, uh, John Hockett, who wants to come out and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beliveau. Uh, a pleasant good evening to everyone in attendance tonight. Welcome to OU's Gaylord Hall, home of the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication. It's our sincerest honor to host this important discussion on OU's campus tonight. I can only believe we all come here as seekers, seekers of answers, of truth, ultimately seekers of justice. You don't have to look far to find examples of our country's desire for justice. Even our own American Pledge of Allegiance has the following closing statement, with liberty and justice for all. Famed American poet, social activist, novelist, playwright, columnist, Langston Hughes penned these words. He said, there are words like freedom, sweet and wonderful to say. On my heartstrings, freedom sings all day, every day. There are words like liberty that almost make me cry. If you had known what I know, you would know why. We need a Langston Hughes today to put into words what many of us are feeling. Maybe the next Langston Hughes is here tonight in this very auditorium. I sure hope so. We need you. Let me close my welcoming remarks with the sage words from the first century Roman philosopher Seneca when he said, only time can heal what reason cannot. Welcome to Hands Up shot down an interactive discussion about Michael Brown. Thank you for your attendance tonight and welcome to Gaylord College. Hello, my name is Mallory Gladstein. I am the program coordinator at the Center for Social Justice. The Center for Social Justice is an initiative of the Women's and Gender Studies program to promote gender justice and human rights through local and global engagement. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Hands Up, Shot Down, an interactive discussion about Michael Brown on behalf of the Center for Social Justice, Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication, and the OU Writing Center. I'd also like to take a quick moment to thank the co-sponsors of this event. The University of Oklahoma Division of Student Affairs, OU Housing and Food Services, the African and African American Studies Program, the Department of Communication, the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Department, the History Department, the Department of History of Science, the Department of Human Relations, the Philosophy Department, the Department of Political Science, and the Sociology Department. Thank you for your support in making this event possible. I'd like to give a brief overview of how tonight will run. Once our MC, Dr. Ralph Belvo, will act as our timekeeper. Each panelist will have six minutes to give remarks, followed by four minutes of questions from the audience. We have four moderators around the room. If our moderators will please wave. Okay, these are, these are our folks that are gonna be recognizing our questions. If you are, if you are joining us via live stream, um, we, we will also be taking questions via Twitter using the hashtag HandsUpOU. It's on the bottom of your program. So if you have questions, please use the hashtag. We will have a moderator following those questions and have an opportunity for you to ask them. We don't want you to be left out of the discussion even though we've overflowed the room, which is something that's very exciting. Because we have such a packed panel, as you can see, we are going to be sticking really strictly to that time limit, so please be aware. If you are live tweeting from, the, from this event, uh, we would ask that you use the hashtag HandsUpOU so that that will help us keep track of all of those and be participants in the discussion. Before I hand the mic off, I'd like to take a moment to thank Dr. Lupe Davidson. She is co-director for the Center for Social Justice and a professor in the College of Business. 
She is the major driving force behind this event, and without her, it would not be possible. And so I just want to take a moment and recognize her and, and <laughs> give her a hand. And now, as we, if, as we head into discussing a very, very emotional, a very raw, a very difficult topic, we're asking that everyone remember that it is a discussion, that you approach it with respect for one another and for the panelists who have chosen to spend their time here tonight. We ask that you approach the subject with, with, a, with a sense of urgency, but an understanding of, of grace for one another as we're trying to uh, chew through something that's very difficult. And so now I will hand the mic back to Dr. Bellevue. Thank you. Um, to start us off, uh, well, actually, there are there were two other people that I wanted to uh, bring attention to from the uh, Norman Human Rights Commission, who I believe are here in the audience. Daniel Dukes, here, okay, and Kay Ham. So we just wanted to welcome you. Thank you very much for participating in this. Um, and uh, right now, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce Michelle Yadiche. Um, who is going to uh, lay out the timeline of the events that we're talking about and give us kind of a starting point. Michelle. How many of you uh, gathered with us last year in this room to talk about Trayvon Martin? It's, it's, uh, it's interesting that we have to gather again as with other events that have brought our campus community together, this is a forum, a gathering that explores what is difficult to understand. My task is to lay out the facts as a timeline. This provides background and context for our discussion. We need to keep in mind two things as we proceed. Michael Brown's death is certainly not the only death of a young man of color we know of that occurred at the hands of police. And two, not all police, not all law, law enforcement officers engage in violent policing. On August 9th, Saturday, was considered day one. At 11.51 a.m., Michael Brown is allegedly involved in a strong arm robbery at a convenience store. Brown allegedly grabbed a convenience store employee by his shirt and pushed him back into a display rack. The event was partially recorded by in-store surveillance camera although the recording does not clearly show the actions alleged. Two young males can be seen entering the store and bringing some items to the front counter, which are apparently some items, and some items fall to the floor. The pair then apparently walk out of the store with some items over the protest of an employee. Whether any money was left for the items or not cannot be readily determined from the video. The owners of the convenience store later said no employee of the store reported a robbery. A customer inside the store made the call to the police. At 12 p.m., Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson left a scene of a call regarding a sick child. At 12.01, Wilson, unaware of the convenience store robbery, encounters Brown walking in the middle of the road. According to police, Brown's presence in the middle of the road was stopping traffic. Brown's friend, Dorian Johnson, who was with him at the time of the confrontation, disputes this. Wilson confronts Brown, and as a result, he shoots and kills him. At 12.04, a second officer arrives on the scene, followed by a supervisor one minute later. An ambulance responding to the earlier sick child call stops and responds to assess Brown's condition. The crime scene is cordoned off by police for investigation, and Brown's body remains in place for several hours. Day two, August 10th, morning. A vigil is held for Brown. Morning, the St. Louis County Police Department holds a press conference. 8 p.m., another vigil is held for Brown. 9 p.m., looting by protesters begins. Day three, August 11th, 2 a.m., the rioting is put under control. 10 a.m., a protest is canceled. Hackers take down the city website. The Jennings School District cancels classes. 
Brown's family holds a press conference and the NAACP holds a press conference. Additional unrest occurs at a quick trip convenience store and is eventually dispersed with the use of tear gas. Day four, August 12th, 12.30 p.m. Al Sharpton is heckled at a press conference in front of the old courthouse in downtown St. Louis. Hackers obtain personal pictures and information about St. Louis County Police Chief John Belmer and post it online. KMOX reports that St. Louis area gun sales have gone up. President Barack Obama issues a statement regarding Brown's shooting. Police charge nine rioters with felonies. Ferguson City leaders request that protests and prayer vigils should only be held in the daytime. Two rallies occur in the evening. Day five, August 13th, 1 a.m. Police shoot another person who reportedly pointed a handgun at an officer. Protests occur for the fifth straight night. Thursday, day six, Missouri State Senator Maria Capel Nadal, who represents part of Ferguson, is tear gassed while with protesters. Later during the day, she tweets, fuck you, Governor Nixon. Nixon announces in a press conference that the Missouri State Highway Patrol will take over policing Ferguson from the St. Louis County Police Department, referring to the change as an operational shift. Day seven, Ferguson Police Chief Thomas Jackson holds a news conference where he simultaneously identifies the officer who shot Brown as Darren Wilson, as well as releasing an incident report naming Brown as the suspect in a strong arm robbery of a Ferguson convenience store. Day eight, August 16th. After midnight on the morning of August 16th, protests again turn violent with numerous instances of looting where there are reports of at least three Molotov cocktails being thrown. The Ferguson market in particular is targeted by looters. Governor Nixon declares a state of emergency. 40 FBI agents arrive in St. Louis. Day nine, August 17th, midnight to 5 a.m. The curfew declared by Nixon is enforced, but a crowd initially defies it. Police use smoke and tear gas to disperse the crowd. A protester is shot during the encounter and is listed in critical condition. Day 10, August 18th, President Obama addresses the riots in a news conference in which he announces that he will be sending U.S. Attorney Eric Holder to Ferguson to monitor the situation. Day 11, August 19th, Kajemi Powell, a 23-year-old African-American man, was shot and killed by two St. Louis police officers. The police had been calling had been called following Powell's alleged shoplifting from a nearby convenience store. Powell, who was holding a steak knife, told the officers, shoot me now. Seconds later, two police officers fired 12 shots, killing Powell. Video captured on the scene shows the officers handcuffing Powell as he lay on the ground, perhaps already dead. St. Louis police chief described the officers' actions as defending themselves and quoted an unnamed witness who described it as suicide by cop. 47 people are arrested on this day. Day 12, Lieutenant Ray Albers of the St. Anne Police Department was suspended indefinitely from his duties after pointing a semi-automatic service rifle at peaceful protesters and threatening them the night before. On August 20th, Attorney General Eric Holder traveled to Ferguson where he met with the residents as well as Brown's family. Six individuals were arrested this day. Day 13, August 21, Nixon withdrew the National Guard from Ferguson after witnessing improvements during the social unrest. Details of Brown's death remain debated. Police officials claim the struggle developed between Wilson and Brown, but witnesses say otherwise. Following the local reactions, national figures have responded as well, including Al Sharpton, who said, the policies of this country cannot go unchallenged. We cannot have aggressive policing of low-level crimes. Sharpton said Monday, we need Congress to have legislation about guidelines in policing. Hillary Clinton also offered a statement. We can do better. We cannot ignore the inequalities that exist in our justice system. 
inequalities that undermine our most deeply held values of fairness and equality. Thank you. Um, I'll introduce the members of our panel, and if uh, you just indicate who you are when I mention you so that we know who's who here. Um, and we'll be hearing from people in this order. Uh, Dr. T. Elon Dancy, Dr. David Chappelle, Dr. Cindy Rosenthal, Dr. Maida Kerstarfin, Chief Keith Humphrey, Dr. Sherry Irvin, Lieutenant Ricky Jackson, Dr. Clemencia Rodriguez, Dr. Greg Graham, and Dr. Ben Keppel. And I will now turn it over to Dr. T. Elon Dancy. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Dr. Lupe Davis and the OU Center for Social Justice and the other sponsoring organizations for uh, inviting me to be a part of this, uh, this panel. And thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, good. Okay. Is that better? Great. Okay. Uh, every 28 hours, a black person is killed by a police officer, security guard, or self-appointed vigilante. When many of us last gathered in this same auditorium to discuss the tragic death of unarmed trial Trayvon Martin, I began with a question from W.B. Du Bois in his groundbreaking work, The Souls of Black Folk. In that book, he asked black people a rhetorical question that I sadly ask again this evening. How does it feel to be a problem? Recall that there is a profound difference between having a problem, which all people are allowed, and being a problem, which is a defining feature in the black American experience. One of the reasons that Michael Brown's tragic death resonates so powerfully with black people, particularly black men, is that it is yet another situation which embeds in our social consciousness the sobering reality that America is not the post-racial, colorblind society many claim. While it is true that the nation elected a black president, it is also true that his, elect, that his election coexists with the following lived realities for black people in general. According to 2011 census data, the net worth of the average black household in the United States is around $6,000, compared to $110,000 for the average white household, and this gap is widening. Black babies are disproportionately born into chronic and abject poverty, with disproportionately high infant mortality rates. Black students are significantly less likely to attend schools offering advanced math and science courses than white students. They are three times as likely to be suspended and expelled even at the age of three years old, which sets them up for educational failure. Today, whites and people of color still do not make the same amount of money for the same work. In fact, white men convicted of felonies without a diploma are likely to be hired as black men without convictions and a diploma. Roland Fryer's research out of Harvard University shows that no matter the merits or qualifications, if your name is thought to belong to a black person, your chances of being called for a job interview significantly diminish. Black and brown populations are over-policed and over-criminalized. In 2011, New York's controversial stop and frisk policy allowed police to stop some 600,000 people of color with no discovery of drugs or otherwise malicious intent. And in the case of Michael Brown, prejudicial thinking of black people as problems and up to no good was exposed by the slain body of an unarmed teenager who appeared to have his hands up in surrender and yet was cut down by six bullets in broad daylight. Two bullets struck him in the head carrying all the expectations of shoot to kill. While society has evolved over time, there are significant ways it just has not. The data I just shared and will share proclaim that black bodies are prejudged and as a result are placed in needless jeopardy. To be black is to bear the brunt of selective law enforcement and to inhabit a psychic uneasiness in which there is no guarantee of personal safety. You are read as a black body first before you are anything else. In the words of author Kiesi Lehman, black people in America are, quote, born on parole, end quote. In the aftermath of the shooting, I'm left with several reactions, but we'll focus on three here um, and hope that time will allow. My first reaction is that history repeats itself. There is, as there has always been, public engagement of black bodies and their communities with indifference at best and terrorism at worst. In terms of indifference, the willful refusal of the Ferguson police to even draft an incident report to indicate how many times Michael Brown had been shot or to release the name of the shooting policeman, none of which are unlawful or unreasonable, 
led many in the Ferguson community to declare the shooting a public lynching. And this description is not far-fetched because when we analyze racial violence, particularly around black men, we learn that police killings pick up where lynchings left off. Scholars estimate that in the late 19th and 20th centuries, two to three blacks were lynched each week in the American South. Some of these images sadistically reproduced as postcards even here in Oklahoma. And today, FBI reports show that between 2005 and 2012, a white officer used deadly force against a black person at the same rate. And again, um, a recent study from an independent organization notes that almost every 28 hours, a black person dies at the hands of police. If your immediate reaction is that the force is justified without question, consider the following data. Among blacks killed by police, nearly 50% are likely to be ages 18 to 21, nearly 50% are likely to be unarmed, and nearly 50% are likely to follow an incident of racial profiling. That is an incident where the interactions began with police belief that the black person looked suspicious and attempts to restrain him or her resulted in a killing. And perhaps unsurprisingly, an astounding 88% of these cases are found to use excessive force. Black male death at the hands of police is hard to track in national reports. However, what we know from FBI data is that young black men are frequently victims of police homicide and that the less clear it is that force was necessary, the more likely the victim is to be black. And I want to repeat this. Right? The less clear it is that force was necessary, the more likely the victim is to be black. And that is FBI data. Additionally horrendous is that the lifeless body of Michael Brown baked in the hot sun for hours in the neighborhood. This moment is one of countless moments that loudly proclaims the irrelevance of the black body unto and even beyond the point of death. The desertion of the body is an indictment on the poor black neighborhood in which Michael Brown lived, a commentary on the area and its inhabitants. In this wasteland, you see, the motionless body requires no deliberate speed and is left to clutter the street like litter. Never have I known police anywhere to leave the body of anyone they kill in a white neighborhood for hours. And there's a recent study um, to support that observation. Uh, the deserted body was there to do what countless murdered and abandoned black bodies did over the last few centuries, articulate messages of community worthlessness and to traumatize and intimidate the neighborhood into emotional, social, and political paralysis. That gruesome scene recalls images of black bodies left in trees during the Reconstruction and Jim Crow eras, the abandonment of the New Orleans Ninth Ward following Hurricane Katrina, financial disinvestment, miseducation, and or undereducation in impoverished areas, and the overrepresentation of black people in privatized prisons. Each is its own commentary about black bodies as disposable. My second reaction is about the role of respectability politics and the naive beliefs of many people, including black people, that if only Michael Brown possessed a respectable presentation, that this would implode a national obsession with killing black people. Respectability politics says that Michael Brown, not Mike Mike, as he was affectionately called by friends, should have not been at the store in the first place, should have shown more reverence to elders, should pull his pants up, should have never been walking in the middle of the road, should have complied with the police officer's demand without comments and without looking up, should have been wearing his Sunday best on Saturday, should be more respectful, and should speak the king's English to the queen's taste. Respectability believes that rule following, wardrobe, education, class standing, traditional families, and political progress will save you. This is a mistake, proven untrue across not the years, but the centuries. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is often celebrated above and beyond Malcolm X as the more respectable black leader, yet both were assassinated as enemies of the state. And for those who still believe that your respectability can save you, recall that Dr. King was shot down in a black silk blend suit. The reality is that American social institutions have for decades been infected with a mindset that black people are problems to be dealt with, managed, and controlled no matter the presentation. Even nonviolent black males are understood as possessing violent tendencies, whether sagging their pants or wearing a suit. If this sounds far-fetched, let me remind you of conservative commentator Ben Stein's recent remarks. In an interview, Ben Stein challenged the use of the term unarmed to describe Michael Brown, saying that Brown, quote, was armed with his incredibly strong, scary self, end quote. <laughs> what else can be deduced from that ideology but that Michael Brown's body is a walking, talking weapon? No need to carry a weapon when you embody one. 
when the black body itself is perceived as a threat and the site of danger. And then my final reaction is the odd introduction of a black on black crime discourse as though relevant to the shooting of Michael Brown. This is illogical. A discussion of one does not give us perspective on the other. At best, what is behind this effort is the assumption that black communities judge black lives to be so worthless that their communities are unjustified in questioning any shady dealings of police, even though police are expected to protect and serve all citizens. At worst is the attempt to distract us from seeking justice for Michael Brown, the people of Ferguson, and the police. I imagine that black people are not happy about black on black crime which is why there are several organizations attempting to address this nationwide. However, a decrease in black on black crime does not indicate a decrease in police on black crime. It never did. Furthermore, these conversations are statistically meaningless as all groups are most likely to kill in proximity. That is, people who are around them in their neighborhoods, networks, and circles. While black people kill other black people at a rate of 90%, white people kill other white people at a rate of nearly 85%. And according to researchers, this 5% difference means that when white people are not killing other white people, they are more likely to be the killers of other groups of color than they are to be killed by them. And according to FBI data, white people are more likely to kill en masse, to blow up buildings, to shoot up schools and universities, to kill their spouses, to kill the elderly and their children. But what is institutionalized over time is that all people should irrationally fear people of color, particularly black people. Let me be clear that no crime in America has ever initiated a national conversation about white on white crime. Why is that? <laughs> Perhaps it is the assumption that black and brown people are the only people who have race and that whiteness is standard, the very definition of human being. To believe this, however, is to be miseducated. White is also a racial position. Over time, the colonizers of this country set into motion a system of white supremacy where they did not just build a country in and of themselves, but did of unspeakable violence and inhumanity to the indigenous people and African Americans. Under this system, ethnic, ethnic origins, whether one is Brazilian, Italian, French, are erased to rewrite white skin color as a master class, and black and brown is inferior. Thus, the power associated with race in this country is one that seeks to assign white bodies unearned privilege, to maintain this control through social institutions, and to ensure that this way of life is never examined. Like Voldemort, in the Harry Potter stories. <laughs> Whiteness is that which will not be named. The, un <laughs> the unwillingness, the unwillingness to self-examine shows up every day in a variety of way ways when we ask questions about people of color but never ask them about ourselves. It is the gaze of those in cafeterias who have the audacity to wonder why are the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria but never ask why they are sitting together. <laughs> who wonder why there are still historically black and tribal colleges, but never confront their own institutions as historically white and ask why that exists, who wonder why predominantly institutions house organizations for bodies of color, yet never learn that historically white institutions are consistently found to exclude, stereotype, count out, and disaffirm both then and now. The aversion to self-examining keeps them from understanding historically white spaces of any kind is violent and unwelcoming and subsequently blinds them from seeing any togetherness among people of color as recognition that there's safety and security in numbers. Um, and I suppose I, I am I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll talk I mean, more. The, the Baltimore thing got me, so. Okay. Excellent. Okay, well, um, maybe I should stop for questions. Yes. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. If you just want, if you have a question, you want to just put your hand up, we can get one of the mics over to you. Um, um, or you can tweet the question if you'd like to do that also. Um, or we can just, you, should we proceed? We move forward? Okay. We'll move forward. Um, our I'm next sorry if I took up the question, Ty. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> do, do you have... Oh, the, yeah, by the way, the tweet, is, the hashtag is HandsUpOU. Okay. Testing. I think all those facts in their addition re require some kind of response. Yes. And I think it's interesting that the biggest response you got from what you said was when you brought up he who cannot be named. Yes. 
and you refer to it as unearned privilege. We used to call it white skin privilege. Yes. And I think more generally, it needs to be understood as unconscious white racism. Mm -hmm. That racism is a white people's problem. Like homophobia is a straight people's problem. Like sexism is a men's problem. Mm -hmm. And this is not a historically black college. I'd even go so far as to say it's a historically white college. Mm -hmm. It is. And this used to be a sundown <laughs> town until 1969. It was not OK for black people to be within the city limits of Norman, Oklahoma yeah. without some kind of threat to their lives. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, what we're talking about here is not black people as the problem, but unconscious white racism as a fundamental root of the issues that have plagued this country for 400 years, <laughs> not just since August 9th. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested to hear some more white people talk about that. We know how black people feel about it. It's white people that need to start talking out loud and talking to their children. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dancy, great job. Um, I have a question regarding uh, the reverse method. Do you have statistics that show where uh, African-American officers are shooting white um, teens. Do you have any type of information or statistics on that? No, but when you talk about uh, black police officers, you're not talking about very many, right? So if you're um, looking at a national number, you're looking at 10% or less of right, police force, right, right that's um, black. But when you find the data, you know, let me No, <laughs> let I, me I was know. just I, curious. I was just yeah, curious. Um, no, 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 no. And if you, and I, I, from what we know, his, I think historically and contemporaneously, that's probably institutionally, um, Unlikely for a number for a number of reasons. Uh, if if it did happen, it wouldn't connect to this overall pathology that I was describing, right? So the pathology of sort of uh, vigilante violence um, on black bodies, visited upon black bodies, goes back to the colonization of the founding of this country, right? Absolutely. So if that if that for some reason was a phenomenon, it wouldn't it wouldn't be pathological. In okay, that. thank you. Um, okay, I think we'll move forward, and uh, because this will turn into a conversation about a lot of these going across our speakers, we'll move on to Dr. David Chappelle. Well, um, thank you very much, Ralph, and I want to uh, echo Dr. Dancy's thanks to Dr. Davidson and other organizers of the panel, and thanks to all of you sitting in the room and uh, watching in other rooms um, for being here on this uh, solemn occasion. I am, uh, I teach history here at OU, and uh, it's my task to try to um, introduce a little historical background. Um, Dr. Dancy already did quite a bit of that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to zero in on some constitutional questions. Um, equal protection of the laws is a phrase that is added to the Constitution in 1868 with the ratification of the 14th Amendment, uh, three years after the end of the Civil War, three years after the uh, abolition of slavery. Uh, equal protection of the laws is what every person uh, is guaranteed under the United States Constitution from that point forward. The word protection has had a very, very broad uh, and powerful meaning, but in cases like the one in Ferguson, Missouri, that's uh, impelled us all together here today, uh, it's actually <laughs> one of the most uh, conservative and, and uh, uh, unadventurous meanings of, of equal protection. It's a, it, it appears, uh, well, it appears as part of a pattern, whatever the particular facts of the case are, and I think it's, I think we'd all agree that not all of those are in. Uh, but there is a pattern of uh, racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. There are patterns of racial discrimination. And I'm guessing that a lot of us are here, uh, well, many of you have said, um, it's, it's a pattern. Uh, there are patterns that, that bring us out whatever, uh, you, you know, 
whatever the peculiarities of this case may be, and all cases are, are peculiar. Um, the equal protection of the laws added to the Constitution in 1868 is the first time that human equality is mentioned in the United States Constitution. The original document ratified uh, in uh, 1789 um, uses the concept of equality once, and I always like to see if anybody knows, it doesn't refer to people, I'll give you that, who, grant, who is granted equality in the first, uh, in the original Constitution up to and including the years of the Civil War, and still to this day. Anybody know? Uh, that's not in the Constitution. It's states in, uh, in the Senate. In fact, it's one provision of the Constitution that is protected, that is currently protected from amendment. The old protection of the slave trade was temporarily uh, protected from amendment also. Human equality is, of course, in the famous Declaration of Independence written by uh, Thomas Jefferson, among other things, a slave owner. Um, but it is not in the Constitution. Uh, it doesn't get introduced to the Constitution. It's a very re uh, revolutionary step, arguably as revolutionary as the abolition of slavery in 1865 in the 13th Amendment. Um, equal protection of laws is added to the Constitution three years after abolition in a climate of racial violence, racialized violence, uh, attacks uh, on the freedmen, uh, the four million uh, former slaves and their families, um, as well as the smaller population of free persons of color or free Negroes as they were called, who had been free, very small population, free before uh, the Civil War, before abolition of slavery, but who were still denied citizenship by the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision of 1857. The 14th Amendment wiped all of that out um, as an effort to reinforce, to guarantee the success of the abolition of slavery. What was perceived to be going on by uh, the party that uh, held the majority in Congress and that uh, mustered uh, super majorities in uh, three quarters of the states to ratify the amendment uh, the, the belief was that the leaders of the unreconstructed southern states were trying to pull the country back towards slavery and nullify the result of the Civil War. Uh, Congress passed a Civil Rights Act, the first Civil Rights Act, much of it still uh, in force today, in 1866, and that was so systematically violated in the southern states that Congress and uh, supporters around the country felt it was necessary to add another amendment and actually to revolutionize the, the, the Constitution and turn it into a proclamation of human equality, which it had not been before. Most of the slave owners said that the Constitution had been written to protect slavery. I think most slave, uh, most, excuse me, most, uh, most historians uh, would agree that that was uh, certainly one of the aims and one of the purposes of the Constitution that was finally settled upon. The abolitionists on the whole agreed that uh, the Constitution before it was rewritten in Reconstruction was a pro-slavery compact, uh, William Lloyd Garrison's words. Frederick Douglass incidentally disagreed with that. He thought there was still a principle of equality and freedom somehow pulsating in the Constitution. That's an interesting uh, debate and discussion. Uh, but this amendment guaranteeing equal protection of the laws has been the most controversial legacy of Reconstruction. It was, reconstruct, uh, it was uh, controversial, violently controversial, to the extent that um, Congress passed another civil rights law in 1871 to help stamp out the uh, the terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan, that uh, was tied to the Democratic Party in the southern states that intimidated uh, with violence uh, members of the Republican Party, that's the overwhelming majority of the freedmen, uh, and lots and lots of white people also uh, were attacked by the Ku Klux Klan. The, the federal government intervened on the strength of that act, prodded by uh, political agitation and outrage of the citizenry who felt that the result of their sacrifice in the Civil War was being trounced by laws that were written by 
the southern states, the black codes, taking advantage of a loophole in the 13th Amendment. The abolition of slavery, remember, says that uh, the 13th Amendment says slavery shall no longer exist except in punishment of a crime. And essentially, southern states took that as a license to, to pass laws that vast numbers of African American voters and their families and their support systems and their communities violated a lot, like vagrancy and delinquency, having no visible means of support, being unemployed, that sort of thing. There's a history uh, that stretches on, uh, struggles with racialized violence, lynching that uh, Dr. Dancy alluded to, um, that was stamped out by people organizing a very divided movement, largely unsuccessful in the North, but it succeeded. Uh, the NAACP declared that lynching had actually been defeated in the early 1950s. There were some exceptions, some very famous ones, but there's a history of people challenging these things and getting recognition and keeping uh, the hope and the courage, not just to start fighting, uh, but to keep on fighting, to make alliances, to find opportunities, and that's as much a part of the history of uh, human equality uh, in these borders as a history of racialized violence uh, supported by state agencies like uh, certain police departments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Okay, well, we will uh, move on ahead and hear from Dr. Cindy Rosenthal. Well, I would add my appreciation again to our, the organizers, especially, especially Dr. Davidson and the Women and Gender Studies program. Um, and I really appreciate the tremendous turnout we see here tonight. And I'm happy to be part of this very distinguished panel. I do teach in the political science department here on campus, but I'm going to speak tonight in terms of my role as the mayor of the city of Norman. Um, and the question that I um, uh, sort of ask myself uh, in uh, thinking about my remarks is to ask the question, could Ferguson happen here? Um, how do you work toward to avoid uh, such a situation happening in a community? Um, how do you build an inclusive community? Uh, and that is a question that actually motivated me a great deal when I became mayor in 2007, and I became aware of some initiatives in some other communities to proactively try to build an inclusive community. Uh, that's been uh, something that I tasked our Human Rights Commission to work on. Uh, two of the members are here tonight. But that group has worked on this issue f since 2007. Uh, they've worked frequently in partnership with our police department um, as active participants in these various dialogues. And the basic concept is, is uh, around dialogue. And what we're doing tonight is, I think, also a reflection of the importance of dialogue because it's through th these kinds of conversations that uh, you make progress, you learn, and you begin to build a climate of inclusiveness. Uh, the Human Rights Commission in Norman has, um, um, I forgot to turn the timer on, sorry about that. Um, the Human Rights Commission in Norman has uh, been very intentional in trying to reach out to populations in our community who often are invisible, uh, often feel excluded, uh, and that has included conversations with uh, very rural parts of Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, that uh, intentionally reaching out to the GLBT community, uh, the Hispanic community. Uh, they've worked in just in the past year uh, in dialogue with people in our community who uh, confront barriers because of disabilities that they have. And this year, the, the commission has uh, uh, taken on the task of being in dialogue with many other groups in the city of Norman uh, who are really concerned about the issue of poverty and homelessness. Um, this is work that is uh, uh, imperfect. It is work that has lots of bumps along the road. Uh, but I think that it has been uh, uh, work that has changed uh, our community. 
I can say with confidence that Norman is no longer a sundown community. I can say with confidence that, that Norman is not a Ferguson, but I also am confident that we have lots of work to continue to do. Um, in 2008, uh, we also, as a council, uh, dedicated ourselves and asked our voters to commit themselves to support a, um, a new public safety sales tax with the primary purpose of um, bringing community-oriented policing to our community. That is a philosophy, and the chief may speak to this a, a bit more, but it's really a, a very different and fundamental kind of philosophy of policing that is in partnership uh, with the community and builds partnerships with the community and really tries to move away from some of the tactics that were predominant um, uh, at, a, at another point in time. Uh, that effort is ongoing. Uh, again, uh, the, the chief may speak to some of those specific efforts, but they, they really uh, are aimed at moving uh, out from uh, behind uh, the, um, the, 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 the car, from behind uh, the, the barriers, and be, trying to be in conversation and to learn about the issues that confront people in our community. Um, I know the chief has also been very committed to trying to diversify our police force uh, through recruitment efforts, and that's uh, looking at gender, race, ethnicity. Uh, uh, we just commissioned our, our first um, uh, Muslim American police officer, and, and that's an effort to really reflect in, in, in more ways the kind of community that we have here in Norman. So what have been the results of some of this effort? Um, I think that there will be some who might find fault, that we'd say we've fallen short, uh, that we should be doing more, and, and you can uh, name whatever particular group you feel is underrepresented or is not heard in our community. Uh, but frankly, I think that we are way ahead of the curve. In preparing my remarks for tonight, I looked at um, uh, some of the res community responses to Ferguson, and there was a common theme of, of places in, uh, around the country that were starting to create dialogues like this one in order to be proactive. And I thought to myself, well, we've, we've been trying to do that. And um, so we're ahead of the curve, at least in trying to, to move the needle on, um, on building relationships. And it's only through relationships that I think you prevent the kind of, of disarray and uh, uh, the, the, the slope of, of activities that Michelle uh, read to us in the daily timeline of what happened in, in Ferguson. Uh, you, you can't start talking after things happen. You have to be talking before things happen. Um, so. Um, have we a, a, a way, long ways to go? I think every community does. Uh, and, uh, but I think that the path to realizing positive partnerships and building a, a, a welcoming and inclusive community is through events like this and through the efforts of our Human Rights Commission. And I urge you to get engaged in those beyond tonight's event uh, to be part of uh, the building a community that we can all be proud of in Norman. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I've been asked if we can hold off on questions until after we hear from the whole panel of speakers. Is that okay with everybody? Um, if that's okay with you, then I think we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Medekar Starfin. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, as others have said, I'm honored to be as part of this discussion. And I want everyone in the audience to kind of take a look at who's here, the diversity of who's here, the diversity of this panel. This will have some bearing on what I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about videos and media and how we're using that in cases like this and what significance we can take from that. I wanted to talk about four things and that will be part of it. But I'm going to enumerate what I want to address briefly. And that will be 
I want to talk about a man. I want to talk about movies. I want to talk about media narratives. And I want to talk about a movement. But let me start by talking about a man. His name was Luis Rodriguez. He was a brown-skinned, big bear of a man. He had a quiet manner that contradicted his appearance. And last year, on Valentine's Day, he took his wife and his daughter to see a movie at the Warren Theater in Moore, Oklahoma, and he died in a violent encounter with police officers in the early hours of February 15th. Now tonight, in solidarity with all of us who are concerned about justice and truth and fairness, both his wife, Nair, and one of his daughters, Lunai, are here tonight, and I'm going to ask them to stand. And I want them to stand. And wave your hand, girl. <laughs> we need to know that there are human beings behind these kinds of stories. And they also need to know that there's a community conversation about who we are fundamentally as a society and that they are part of that conversation and should be part of that conversation. Also joining them is a, a couple of proud OU alums who are part of their legal team. Mr. Kenyatta Bathia, if you would stand, wave your hand. Marcus Bivens is assisting him. And as a team, they have much to announce in the future about this case. And they will talk in more detail and more time than, and even more, and more knowledge and understanding than I have. But I just ask you to wait, to listen, and to watch. But secondly, let's talk about the movies. And let's talk about the ability we all now have to record and document the moments of our lives. We now see these instant pieces of media become so crucial in determining how unarmed men and youth in brown bodies become the targets of fear and violence. Trayvon Martin walking home from a convenience store. John Crawford III shopping in a Walmart. Michael Brown holding his hands up in submission in a street in Ferguson, Missouri. Luis Rodriguez on the steps entering the parking lot of the Warren Theater. Now, all of these incidents were documented in some way, whether through a cell phone or institutional camera or monitoring device. And now we are seeing discussions in the larger society about whether or not we should require all police to wear cameras during encounters with citizens. Well, from a media perspective, this could be a good thing because we are a profession that love our images, okay? And now we have more outlets to show them. So media can run video and audio tapes as part of the facts supporting their telling of stories as news. But media scholars have also brought to bear in the practice of journalism some important scrutiny and questions about those facts. They do it through such theories as Oh, framing, agenda setting, standpoint, more than uh, ideas than I can discuss right now. But these theories challenge the notion that facts in and of themselves are meaningful. Well, I want you to think about that for a moment. At which point, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to talk about Aristotle. Now, we are on a college campus, and I'm allowed to talk about Aristotle just for a minute. Now, those of us who know our history understand that there were ancient societies that predated Aristotle that thought about and wrote and communicated with elegance in China and Africa, but that's a different lecture. Right now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something that Aristotle put forth, because you're likely to hear that name again in other classes, right, as he talked about what it takes to persuade people. He looked at two kinds, categories of proof. He would call it artistic, inartistic. The inartistic proof is what we would call facts, evidence, what you can see, things that you can point to, rules, laws. 
And he said, that's all well and good. But there's another category of proof. That, and I think this is the part of, of argument that gets into these larger ideas that really concern us. What is justice? What is fairness? Where's the fact that you can hold up and wave and show what that is? It takes more than that. It takes speaking from an ethical place, a place of credibility, a place, a place of integrity and authenticity. It takes being able to appeal to reason and to logic in a way that moves the audiences you, you're speaking to. It also takes emotion and the ability to connect with people. You put all of that together, you just might have a chance to persuade somebody. So now let's get back to all these videos and audio tapes and other types of evidence that we have. If we show a video of a man on the ground being beat by other men standing over him, are we watching an assault of an unarmed, defenseless man? Or are we watching an appropriate response to a threat in our society? That is the question. And that does not get answered by the showing of a video or the hearing of an audio tape. It gets answered by narrative, by voices, by people like us being willing to enter into conversation with other people not like us about the meaning of the days that we live, the nights that we experience, and the type of community that we want to live in. We can't be silent. We, each one of us, has a stake in that conversation because the us and the them of a particular battle is going to change. Today, it's Michael Brown. Who will it be next month or next year? So facts in and of themselves have no agency. Which brings me to media narratives. So we need to be participating in that kind of conversation. And how can we do it? I think it begins with a decision. For instance, and I'm going to just throw this out as I transition to talk about my final point of movements. Here's my prop. This is a $20 bill. This is about what it would cost me to go to see a movie at the Warren Theater and maybe, if I'm thrifty, get a little popcorn or a drink or something, okay? <laughs> maybe if I get in there, it's matinee. Now, one day after Louise died, I said, no, not today. I'm going to do something different. When I thought about going to the movies, and I go somewhere else. Now, I'm not saying that the lack of my $20 is something that anybody notices. But I wonder if my $20 joined with your $20, joined with your $20, and yours and yours, would that bring about a conversation from, say, the Warren Theater, which has been silent to this point, about who they were protecting and why. Just asking you to think about that. I'm not saying don't go to the movies. I go to the movies. <laughs> but can we be intentional? And that's why I ask you to think about hashtag no more movies and talk about what you're choosing to do instead of spending your $20. Think about it. And the last thing I want to throw out to you an idea of a movement is that we lurch from episode to episode. We were here, as other speakers have pointed out, talking about Trayvon Martin last, year, last fall, last spring, we were talking about Luis Rodriguez. And we come together out of this genuine concern to want to connect. But what if? there was a mechanism for us to do this on campus, students. And what if we had something say, oh, call it, I don't know, the Justice League. I'm not talking about the superheroes. 
I'm talking about the real potential heroes in each one of you, an organized, at the ready, community organization that says we're going to be here to formulate responses, to show our concern, to share resources, and not have to scramble every time we do it. I don't know. Could that work? If it could work, what would happen if this were at OSU, if this were at OBU? Oh, and what would happen if it crossed the border? And now we're talking about UT Austin and A&M. Oh, my goodness, and what if we got out of the region? And nationwide, there were justice leagues of people concerned and willing to be in conversation about the type of society we want to live in. And I'm going to tell you that that conversation is not just about those of us who believe we are victimized. It has to include those who we think are the victimizers. Because we want to be in conversation with someone who doesn't see the humanity in my brother or sister or son. I want to know what happened to you that you can go in a Walmart and look at a man buying a toy gun and call him a threat. I want to know because that's a problem and we need to talk about it. And maybe it's something that we can all work together on. So I want you to think where we go, think about where we go from, that, from here. And don't rely on the media story of the moment to carry you through. We have to be more strategic than that. But it's only going to happen when someone else, and a number of someone else's, maybe just wake up one day and says, nope, not today. I'm going to do something different. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirsten. Next, we will hear from Chief Keith Humphrey. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here. And Dr. Davidson, thank you for uh, getting this program together. And I'll tell you, a year ago, uh, if you would have told me that we would be back here today talking about the death of another uh, African-American male, I would not have believed you. Uh, I, would have, I, I would not have wanted to believe you. Uh, it, it's very, it is very sad. But one of the things that I want to I talk to you all about is that Mayor Rosenthal mentioned community-oriented policing and an inclusive community. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. The citizens, number one, they have to have an open heart. You've got to have an open heart. Just like the police officers have to have an open heart. There has to be an open mindset on both sides. There has to be open eyes. Your eyes have to be completely open. There also has to be open mouth dialogue between multiple groups. The last time I did some research on communication, you have to have a message. The message has to be spoken. It has to be received. And there has to be feedback. So you can't just have a message and you can't perceive that someone understands what you're doing or what you're thinking. And also, you must have vision. Vision has to be on both sides. One of the things that I, I tell my guys on a daily basis, or on a weekly basis, or on a regular basis, is that we cannot look at problems through the eye of a needle. We have to look at, we have to look at the community and problems through the eye of a hula hoop. Now think about that. The difference between a needle and a hula hoop is different. And you have to look at, you have to look at, you have to see the big picture. Um, it's my responsibility as the police chief, or any police chief's responsibility, to set the tone for his department and also set the tone for the community. We have to be open. I have to be open each and every day. I have to ensure that, number one, each and every one of my officers is colorblind. And I, have, and I ask the community to look at the same, to, to have the same view. 
we do not and we should never serve a community, just certain sections of the community. One of the things that, that we, we talk about in our department on a regular basis, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're homeless, it doesn't matter if you live in a 20,000 20, square foot home, everyone deserves the same quality service. We tell our guys on a regular basis. We only exist as an organization, city government, police department, public works, whatever department you may, you may refer to, we only exist because our citizens allow us to exist. Now, why would you not want to provide, as a police department or as a police chief, why would you not want to provide top quality service to your citizens? And as citizens, why would you not expect that same in return? Okay? The thing that I want you all to understand is it is not difficult to have a colorblind community if you have both entities being city government and the community demanding the same thing. You all owe, we, you guys have a, have a responsibility to hold us accountable, okay? You have that responsibility. Let me, let me give you a little story about, about myself. <clears throat> Before I came to Norman, I was the police chief for the city of Lancaster. Lancaster is similar, Lancaster, Texas, which is similar to the city of Ferguson in makeup, population, demographics. Lancaster is 71% African American population. The police department was 85% white. There was no relationship between the police department and the community of Lancaster. You first have to admit you have a problem before you can solve that problem. And in order to admit the problem, you've got to, in order to be colorblind, you've got to admit that we've got issues to work on. It doesn't matter if it's black, white, or whatever. We're an inclusive community. We all should be on the same page. When you admit you have a problem and you start actively working on that problem, and when you tell the community, we hear you. We hear what you're saying. We understand that you don't agree with some of the tactics we use, but let me tell you why we use these tactics. You may not agree with this, but let me explain why we do it. We're not expecting everybody to, to agree with us, but we do owe everybody an explanation of why we do the things that we do. The other thing is, we tell the citizens we want to fix it, and when we have to listen, then the citizens have to listen to our needs also. We have to admit that we want to work together, okay? A puzzle, 250 pieces of a puzzle. You can't tell what this is a picture of. You can't use 249 pieces of the puzzle to get a clear picture. You have to use 250 pieces of the puzzle to get a clear picture. Number two, there's 121,000 citizens in the city of Norman. There's 35,000 students on the campus of OU. There's 170 officers in the city of Norman. Everyone has to work together. We have to be open to the needs of the citizens. The citizens have to be willing to listen to us. We have the right, you have the right to ask us, or you have the right to disagree with us. But the thing that I ask each and every one of you all to do in order to maintain a colorblind community is let the picture be clear. When you don't understand something, ask the questions. How do you ask the questions? How do you find out if the pictures are clear? We have programs, the Citizens Police Academy. One of the best programs since community-oriented policing was, was, was uh, uh, founded. This allows citizens to take part in an active program where you learn every part of the law of a police department. Now, I can't speak on behalf of the other police departments, but I will tell you in the last three years, we have graduated 120-some citizens from our Citizens Police Academy. 
that's 120 more citizens that understand why and how we do our job. They may not agree with some of the tactics, but they understand why we do them. And I challenge you guys as students, as citizens, to take advantage of the programs that your tax dollars pay for. Go to those programs. Do ride-alongs. Understand. Ask questions. Demand meetings with your police chief with his command staff, with your city government, with the mayor, the city manager, when you don't understand something. I was listening. How do you go? It's, it's just unheard of for you to go two weeks when there's such a tragic incident like the Michael Brown shooting, and there's a two-week lapse, and you don't have community lead, you don't have city government, the police chief, the city manager, the mayor, reaching out, speaking with whether it's the Brown family or the community, 